good morning students let us start the class in the last class i was discussing this particular craft inequality and i had discussed the five properties of efficient codes so this craft inequality is basically a method to measure the uh, efficiency of the code so that the code will be having instantaneous property and it will be having the optimal property so let me repeat whatever i had told in the last class also if q is the number of code words and if li is the length of a particular code word then k is equal to summation of i equals 1 to q of 2 power minus li and the necessary sufficient condition for the existence of an instantaneous binary code is k must be less than or equal to 1 this expression is called as craft macmillan inequality However, it does not mean that a code which satisfies this inequality is always going to be instantaneous. This means any instantaneous code should fulfill this particular criteria of k equals less than or equal to 1. But any code which is fulfilling this criteria of k equals less than or equal to 1 need not be an instantaneous code. It is only truth from the one side. On the other side, it need not be true. Which means every code that satisfies this uh, craft inequality need not be instantaneous. But every instantaneous code has to satisfy the craft Macmillan inequality. And example we will see now. Consider the following codes. There are totally four codes. Code 1, code 2, code 3 and code 4. Now S1 is... 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, that way you can see this code 1 for S1, S2, S3, S4, 4 symbols are there. For the 4 symbols in code 1 it is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Code 2 is 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Code 3 is 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. And code 4 is 0, 1, double 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Now you can observe all these codes. Uh, it seems as if they are all uniquely decodable. Now let us see the instantaneous property. K is given by K equals summation of I equals 1 to 4 of 2 power minus L I. I equals 1 to 4 because there are now 4 symbols. For each code set for these 4 symbols, let us compute the value of K. Now for code 1, code 1 you can see all the codes, all the symbols are having equal number of digits in each code. So it is summation of 2 power minus 2 plus 2 power minus 2 plus 2 power minus 2 plus 2 power minus 2. That is nothing but equal to 1. Here the condition is k must be less than or equal to 1. So now it is k is equal to 1 in the case of first code. Let us see in the second code k is 2 power minus 1 plus 2 power minus 2. Here you can see for the very first symbol it is one digit second symbol is two third symbol is two third symbol is fourth symbol is three so two power minus one plus two power minus two plus two power minus two plus two power minus three is 1.125 which means the second code is not satisfying the Kraft Macmillan inequality the reason is you can see that this one one is present in the fourth symbol as well as the prefix we had discussed earlier that there should not be a prefix there. Any code should not appear as a prefix to some other code for other symbol. If it appears, then it means that instantaneously it cannot be decodable at the receiver. Now, when the receiver receives 1, 1, it has to wait for one more digit. If the other digit is 0, then it has to decode it as S4. Otherwise, let us say if the other digit is 1, then the receiver has to decode these 1, 1s as S3 itself. Which means code number 2 is not instantaneous and that is proved here. K is now more than 1. Let us see the first code 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. In this, there is no prefix of any other code. Means S1 is not appearing as prefix for S2, S3, S4. Similarly, S2, S3, S4 also, they are not appearing as prefix for any other codes. And it is satisfying the Kraft Macmillan inequality as well. Now, which simply means that code 1 is instantaneous. 
it simply means that code 1 is instantaneous. So let me annotate this. Code 1 is satisfying the Kraft Macmillan inequality and code in code 1 we can we can observe that no code is a prefix of any other code. Whereas in code 2 we can see that this 1 1 is present here in S4 which means code 2 is not instantaneous code just by an observation we can find out and we have seen now that its k is more than 1. What about code 3? You can see here 0 0 1 1 1 0 0 1 1 0 but you can see this S2 is appearing as prefix in S4. When S2 is appearing as prefix in S4 which means that even code 3 is not instantaneous code 2 and code 3 are not instantaneous what about code 4 in code 4 none of the codes are prefixes you can see 0 is not a prefix to any other code similarly 100 is not a prefix 110 is not a prefix which means that code 4 and code 1 we should say that code 1 and code 4 are instantaneous and we should say that code 2 and code 3 are non instantaneous. Now we have computed k for code 1 and code 2. Okay. When we computed code for, uh, sorry, k for code 1 and code 2, we have found out that for uh, the first code k is 1 and we have observed that it is uh, satisfying. That means outright we can come to a decision that code 1 is instantaneous. Now the question is, if visually if it is possible to observe the code and check, then why should you go for this verification of computing the value of k? The reason is, if the symbols are less in number and if the codes are less in number, then it is easily possible to visually verify. And one more thing is there, now because of the advent of the computers and the software programming, now it is easy to write a program for this code as well. For example, we can always check the prefix property just by writing a uh, program in C language or in any other programming language. But in those days, decades before when they were working with this information theory, computers were not extensively used as they are used now. So that is when Kraft and Macmillan together found out a method of computing this K. Let me go to the Third code, see, code 3 is k is 2 power minus 1, 2 power minus 2 plus 2 power minus 3 plus 2 power minus 3. That means for code 3 it is satisfying 1. But we have seen now this 1 1 is a prefix for S4, S2 is a prefix for S4, which means code 3 is actually not instantaneous. But it is satisfying the craft inequality, which means I told you earlier. This particular uh, craft inequality condition is only one sided condition, which means any instantaneous code should satisfy the craft inequality. But any code that satisfies the craft inequality need not be instantaneous. That is what is seen here in the case of code 3. Lastly, for code 4, k equals 2 power minus 1 plus 2 power minus 3 plus 2 power minus 3 plus 2 power minus 3. Here again, 0 0.5 plus 0 0.125 plus 0 0.125 plus 0 0.125. It is coming as 0.875. Now this is again less than 1 which indicates it is instantaneous and we have visually also observed code 4 is instantaneous. Visually we have observed that code 1 and code 4 are instantaneous. For code 1 and code 4 craft inequality is uh, proved. For code 3 even though craft inequality is proved we have visually observed that it is not an instantaneous code. So this way, whatever I told, there is a brief explanation here. Here code 2 is not satisfying the craft inequality and hence it is not an instantaneous code. This is directly evident by the observation as code word of S3 is the prefix of the code word of S4. Now considering code 3, even though it is satisfying craft inequality, it is not instantaneous as the code word of S2 is the prefix of the code word of S4. However, in code 1 and code 4, there are no such prefixes and hence both of them are instantaneous codes. That is what is our conclusion till now.
Let us try to prove this craft inequality in a simple fashion. Let the code words be arranged in the ascending order of length as L1, L2, L3 and so on. Let N1 represent the number of messages encoded into binary code words of length 1. Then we have for i equals 1, N1 is less than or equal to 2 as we have only 0 and 1. Let N1 represent the number of messages encoded into binary code words of length 1. So obviously we have for i equals 1, n1 is less than or equal to 2 as we have only 0 and 1. For i equals 2, for getting an instantaneous code, we must start encoding using the unused symbol only as the first digit. Because we want to have this prefix property where no symbol must be prefixed for some other uh, code. So for and the second digit can be 0 or 1. Hence, we have this expression for i equals 2, n2 is less than or equal to 2 minus n1 into 2 or n2 is less than or equal to 4 minus 2n1. Similarly, for i equals 3, n3 is less than or equal to 4 minus 2n1 minus n2 into 2 or n3 is less than or equal to 8 minus 4n1 minus 2n2. Similarly, for n4, should be less than or equal to 8 minus 4 n1 minus 2 n2 minus n3 into 2 or n4 is less than or equal to 16 minus 8 n1 minus 4 n2 minus 2 n3. So proceeding this way in general we can write this expression as n i is less than or equal to 2 power i you can you can relate the upper line n4 with this n i equals 2 power i see n4 and you have 16 16 is 2 power 4 and 8 is 2 power 3, 4 is 2 power 2, 2 is 2 power 1. So that way, n is less than or equal to 2 power i minus 2 power i minus 1 into n1 minus 2 power i minus 2 into n2 minus, that way it goes on, minus 2 n of i minus 1. Therefore, 2 power i minus 1 into n1 plus 2 power i minus 2 in n2, n2 plus, like that if we proceed, plus n i is less than or equal to 2 power i. All this, let me annotate, all these uh, variables which are having the minus symbol, they can be shifted to the left hand side. When they are shifted to the left hand side, you can see 2 power i minus 1 into n1 that is coming here. Similarly, the complete right hand side is coming to the left hand side except this 2 power i. So, we have this less than or equal to 2 power i. Multiplying throughout by 2 power minus i because we want to have that 1. Multiplying throughout by 2 power minus i, what we get is 2 power i minus 1 into 2 power minus i and we get 2 power minus 1 into n1 plus 2 power minus 2 into n2 plus 2 power, it goes on like that, 2 power 1 minus i, n of i minus 1 plus 2 power minus i into n i is less than or equal to 1. At the right hand side, you will see 2 power i when it is multiplied by 2 power minus i. It is going to become 2 power 0 that is nothing but 1. So this way it is proved. We can have a summation here now. Summation of m equals 1 to i of nm into 2 power minus m. That is what is this left hand side. Is less than or equal to 1. We have n1 code words of length 1, n2 code words of length 2 and so on. Therefore, Summation of m equals 1 to i of nm 2 power minus m equals summation of j equals 1 to n1 of 2 power minus 1 plus j equals 1 to n2 of 2 power minus 2. That way it goes on. We are just having a expression for this particular summation. And we know that this is nothing but less than or equal to 1 from the expression which is mentioned above. So what is this now? We took one intermediate variable as j purposefully because we want to have an expression for this LHS. Now we have this particular expression which is in the middle. Now the one which is in the middle is as n1, n2, n1 plus n2 plus up to ni is nothing but q. We can simply write it as summation of i equals 1 to q of 2 power minus li is less than or equal to 1. Now this way the craft inequality is satisfied. There is a note here.
Instantaneous code is also called as prefix code as there is no code word which is a prefix of any other code word. This I told you earlier. In fact, this is a funny way of telling things. Let me annotate. There is no code word which is a prefix of any other code word. Okay, that is the meaning. Still it is called as a prefix code. Strictly speaking, it should be called as a no prefix code. Isn't it? Instantaneous code has to be called as a no prefix code. But I don't know how this misnomer which is actually opposite meaning it came into picture and even today we follow it as a prefix property. We should say that it is a no prefix property. To tell you a small joke, one student was always pronouncing this electricity as electricity and the teacher kept on correcting the student. But the student was continuously telling the same way. He was always pronouncing wrongly. One day fed up with this particular mistake, the teacher called the parent and told the parent that I have been training and I have been telling your son that he should pronounce electricity as electricity, but he is always telling it as electricity. Now father said, what to do madam? That is his capacity. Okay, <laughs> this way the father was making a mistake at home and the son was continuing the same mistake. He was not pronouncing properly. The same way, we don't know who started this particular uh, misnomer or wrong way of addressing the code. Strictly speaking, instantaneous code should be called as no prefix code because there is no code word which is a prefix of any other code word. But they started calling it as prefix code and they started calling it as prefix property and that is what is mentioned everywhere even now even in some of the textbook also it is mentioned in the same fashion. Just to give you one more example we all know that the transistor is having dissimilar area in the three uh, regions. The BJT is having collector as a large region emitter as a middle region and base as a small region. But in most of the textbooks, you will see the diagram of the transistor where all the three regions are written equally. If it is CBE, collector base emitter, they are all written as some square boxes and inside it is written collector base emitter. Or if it is a NPN transistor, it is simply written NPN. And when you look at this diagram, you will feel as if all the three regions are equal in area or in size. But strictly speaking, collector must be written in a larger size and base must be written in a smaller size and emitter must be written in a medium size. But when textbooks themselves are doing these mistakes, then how do we correct them? In fact, that is why sometimes teachers are required. All the textbooks may not be helping that way. Okay, many textbooks will have such mistakes. That is where teacher's guidances are required. Anyway, let me proceed further. We have a theorem now called source coding theorem. We don't have its proof in the syllabus, but we have this theorem now. We know that L equals summation of I equals 1 to Q of Ni into Pi. We have done many such exercises using this. Let me annotate this again. We have been using this expression extensively in our exercises. This is the average number of bits per symbol in the source coding process. Now there is a Shannon's first theorem also known as source coding theorem. Shannon's first theorem is also known as source coding theorem. There are students waiting in the lobby but I am unable to admit them. Something has happened here in the settings. They are waiting in the lobby but that admit button should come here. That admit button is not highlighted here. So I am sorry, I am unable to admit them. Okay, now there are two theorems. In this chapter we are going to discuss the source coding theorem or the Shannon's first theorem. In the next module we have one theorem called channel coding theorem that is also called as Shannon's second theorem. Okay, so source coding theorem or the Shannon's first theorem states that 
for a discrete memoryless source the average code word length for any method of source encoding is bounded as l is greater than or equal to h of s i'll repeat for a discrete memoryless source the average code word length for any method of source encoding is bounded as l is greater than or equal to h of s memoryless source means symbols are statistically independent and discrete means symbols are emitted one after the other and not continuously for such a source shannon says is first theorem as the average number of bits which are used during source encoding average number of bits per symbol used in the source encoding process is always greater than or equal to the total entropy of the source which simply means uh, entropy is the minimum value for l l can be greater than entropy we had earlier seen in the first module when we discussed this markov sequences we had seen that when they are statistically dependent we had seen an expression of g1 g2 g3 like that and we had seen that as the number of symbols in a given sequence or as the number of bits in a given sequence increase the average information content per symbol reduces but again it it is coming to a limit of entropy itself there as well here also we can see that we want to have l minimum isn't it we want to have the average number of bits per symbol minimum but the average number of bits per symbol during our source encoding can be as minimum as the source entropy itself it cannot be less than the source entropy it is obviously that way why because if something is less than the source entropy then it means that what is entropy entropy is the average information content per symbol for the source itself right before doing the source encoding what is this h of s h of s is the average information content per symbol which is the default property of the source before doing the source encoding itself now l comes into picture only when we actually encode all the symbols that are in the source naturally if l becomes less than h of s then definitely we are going to lose information there this is obvious but shannon proved it of course its proof is not in our syllabus because proof is much bigger but shannon proved it mathematically that we cannot reduce the number of bits per symbol less than the entropy of the source now this theorem indicates this theorem indicates that the entropy represents a fundamental limit on the code word length and hence l min can be h of s i have been telling you repeatedly that we cannot Uh, have any such factor of efficiency or the measurement of efficiency which can be less than the source entropy itself if it can be less than the source entropy then it simply means that we are losing information from the source so the theorem indicates that the entropy represents a fundamental limit on the code word length and hence l min is equal to h of s for a prefix code i should again say it's a no prefix code but as prefix code is a convention for a prefix code or for an instantaneous code the average code word length is bounded as l is in between entropy and entropy plus 1 now this you can remember this will be useful for us this will be useful for us you can see h of s is the entropy of the source h of s plus 1 is one factor there now for an instantaneous code we have this advantage that l is greater than h of s but l is less than h of s plus 1 which means the average uh, bits per symbol when the symbols are encoded is bound by h of s and h of s plus 1 that means we can feel happy saying that even though we cannot minimize l we can actually minimize l which is only 
प्लस वन ऑफ एच ऑफ एस दैट मीन्स इट नीड नॉट बी मच लार्जर ऑल्सो दैट वे वी कैन फील हैप्पी दैट वी आर मिनिमाइजिंग द सोर्स एंड कोडेड बिट्स विद ऑल दीज बेजिक्स लेट मी कम टू दी लास्ट कोडिंग मेथडोलॉजी इन दिस पर्टिक्युलर मॉड्यूल दैट इज कॉल्ड हफपन कोडिंग इन द बिगिनिंग we discussed two types of codes one code is shannon encoding one code is shannon fano encoding and there we had seen the uh, advantage of shannon fano encoding when compared to the shannon encoding but later on we discussed what actually is required for us in the information theory and we discussed the five properties of codes and we want to have an instantaneous code and we want to have this l min we want to have both so that at the receiver it can easily decode the transmitted bits and at the same time during transmission we can save the resources that is our fundamental requirement or objective as i repeat the same thing again we have to convey more but we have to transmit less now this is the last code which is called as huffman code which is an improvement of the previous two codes actually shannon fano code was an improvement of the shannon encoding huffman coding is an improvement of the shannon fano encoding itself this is a source code in which l approaches the fundamental limit that is why i discussed the shannon's first theorem or source encoding theorem and that theorem is utilized in the huffman coding in other words huffman coding method achieves the minimum possible average word length approaching the source entropy and hence achieving maximum efficiency therefore it is also known as minimum redundancy code or optimum code or compact code remember the five properties which we had discussed uh, uh, earlier the last property of the code was optimal code after the instantaneous property we had discussed the optimal property where we wanted to have l minimum now this huffman coding methodology is satisfying that that is what is also called as optimum code also called as compact code please remember this particular word compact code many times in the textbooks or many times in the question papers they refer the name as compact code or they may say as optimum code also otherwise they will call it as huffman code so you have to remember huffman code is synonymous with optimum code and it is synonymous with compact code whenever we give you an exercise for you to let us say encode using a compact coding methodology you should immediately remember compact code is nothing but huffman code or optimum code let me proceed in discussing this particular coding methodology the procedure for huffman coding is first one the source symbols are arranged in the decreasing order of probability as such we have been following the same methodology the source symbols are arranged in the decreasing order of probability the last two symbols are combined into a single composite symbol by adding their probabilities and this reduced source is designated as sa the last two symbols which are arranged in this manner they are combined into a single composite symbol by adding their probabilities now we will call it as another small source called sa further the last two symbols of source sa are combined into one symbol in the same way and this reduced source is called as sb this way it goes on the procedure is continued until we have only two symbols which are encoded as 0 and 1 you will understand this when i show you the exercise this procedure will continue anyhow when we keep on making it compact 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 that is what is called as compact code why the last two symbols are combined together into one that what goes on finally we will end up with having only two only two symbols until we have only two symbols the topmost one and the below one because we had arranged the symbols in the decreasing order so the procedure is continued until we have only two symbols which are encoded as 0 and 1 respectively now for those two symbols we give the value 0 and 1 because only two are there now we will go backward 
when we go backward we will keep on adding zeros and ones in the same fashion till we reach to the first column where we had started where we had all the symbols when we go backwards this way we will have all the codes which are available and this procedure is going to yield into a compact code so now the encoding is continued backwards with the respective zeros and ones until the completion of the encoding process up to the first column now i'll show you an example you can understand this procedure clearly we have an exercise here for the huffman coding or the optimum code or the compact code a discrete memoryless source has an alphabet as follows s0 s1 s2 s3 s4 0.55 0.15 0.15 0.10 0 0.05 now compute two different huffman codes for this source it is possible to have two different coding methodologies depending upon how we choose 0 and 1 i'll show you that example compute two different huffman codes for the source and find their efficiency compute the variances of word lengths in both cases i'll show you later on how to compute the variances of this word lengths now first procedure is we have to arrange them in the decreasing order so here s0 is having the highest probability already they are arranged in the decreasing order here you can see this s0 s1 s2 s3 s4 are arranged in the decreasing order now while placing the composite symbols there can be two approaches now as low as possible or as high as possible as i told you how we choose 0 and 1 that way now let us first see as low as possible because we have to compute two codes now the first code is as low as possible let us arrange the codes as s0 s1 s2 s3 s4 they are already arranged this way now what we have to do we have to combine the last th two symbols last two symbols s3 and s4 that is 0 0.10 0 0.05 we get it as 0.15 and then we again add this 0 0.15 0 0.15 now what we do we are choosing a method called as low as possible which means the least probability we will write it down the highest probability we will write it up if you follow that method now 0.15 plus 0.15 became 0.3 naturally this 0.3 has to go up because the upper one 0.15 has to come down now again we add 0.30 plus 0.15 it becomes 0.45 now we are left with only 0 0.55 and 0 0.45 you can see this again remember we are following a method of as slow as possible which means we are arranging the probabilities always even in the next columns in the decreasing order itself that is why we have to shift this 0 0.30 up and we have to bring this 0.15 down now for 0 0.55 we can give 0 and 0 0.45 we can give one easily we can give this way okay now i am able to admit the students now so for s0 we directly have this zero here okay then let us say we come down when we come down from this 0 0.45 we have again these two for the upper one we will add zero the for lower one we will add one now this 0 0.30 is again comprising these two for the upper one we will write 0 the lower one we will write 1 lastly again this 0.15 is comprising of 0 0.10 0 0.05 for the upper one we will write 0 and the lower one we will write 1 that way now we have written these codes now s0 s1 s2 s3 and s4 you can see here we have 0 0 each of these we are going to write now this 0 1 then here it is along with this 0 we have 0 1 0 1 1 this is 0 then 1 0 1 1 we will move backwards now keeping from right to left please remember this procedure we are moving from right to left now so this is now 1 0 and this is now 1 1 next again when we go here this is now 1 1 and 0 See this way not one one zero sorry it is one zero zero and one zero one because this is anyhow one one there it ends one one ends there then we have one 
zero zero and one zero one. Lastly, we have from here when you go to this zero one zero one zero and one zero one one. You can see this here. Let me annotate. Lastly, we have one zero one zero and again we have one zero one and one so you can see this one zero one zero and one zero one one now finally we have this particular code where we can directly allocate codes to the symbols where S0 is 0, S1 is 1, 1, S2 is 1, 0, 0, S3 is 1, 0, 1, 0, and S4 is 1, 0, 1, 1. So, this is a procedure. Procedure is simple, but you will have to understand the procedure clearly. Now, let us find out the efficiency. Finally, we have this code. Please note this. S0 is 0, S1 is 1, 1, S2 is 1, 0, 0, S3 is 1, 0, 1, 0, S4 is 1, 0, 1, 1. We have the final code. And you can see that there is no code which is a prefix of any other code. Let us find out L. L is summation of i equals 1 to 5 of Ni into Pi. 1 into 0.55 for the first one. 2 into 0.15 for the second one. 3 into 0.15 for the third one. Last two are 4 into 0.10 and 4 into 0.05. We get 1.9 bits per symbol. I will keep on using this particular uh, method here b slash s is bits per symbol why i write like that because if at all we write b p s what does it mean <coughs> let us say we have b p s what does it mean b p s means bits per second here when i use this method or this notation b slash if i use then I can simply say it is bits per symbol. It is not bits per second. So I am going to follow this method. Wherever there is a data rate, I am going to write BPS. Wherever there is this bits per symbol, I am going to simply write B slash S there. So we have found out L now. That is 1.9 bits per symbol. Let us find out the entropy. Entropy is H of S is summation of Pi into Lg of 1 over Pi, right? Remember that, whatever we discussed in the earlier classes. So, we get the H of S or entropy as 1.8439 bits per symbol. So, we can find out the efficiency for this first code is 1.8439 divided by 1.9 equals 97.05. That means this code is 97% efficient. Now, quickly let us see the second method. In the second method, it is as high as possible. Look at the same method. We are arranging the codes in the same decreasing order. But now, 0, 1, 0, 0.10, 0, 0, 0.15. This 0.15 can be moved to the top here itself. Or it can be kept bottom also. It doesn't matter much. Or we are moving it here. That is why I am telling you, in the method of Huffman coding, we will have different sets of codes and all of them are instantaneous codes but all of them may not be optimal fully only when we find out the efficiency we will come to know which one is having the highest efficiency otherwise there are multiple codes possible here depending upon how you arrange them now in this example i am arranging this 0.15 as a total number at the top itself i can arrange it here also because they are all equal simply for the sake of an exercise i have written it here now, this 0.15 plus 0.15 became 0 0.30. Now, 0 0.55, 0 0.30, 0 0.15. Next, this 0 0.15, 0 0.30 became 0.45. That is why now it is called as as high as possible, where we have placed it at the top. Now, when we placed it at the top, again we have the 0 and 1. Let us move backward now. When we move backward, 1 and then 0 here. 1, 1, that is the end now. 1, 0, again 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Now, 1, 0, 0 is the end here. Is it? 1, 0, 1 is the end here. Is it? Yes. But this 1, 1 doesn't end actually. 1, 1 will go back here and it will come here. 1, 1, 0 will happen here. 1, 1, 1 will happen here. 
Now you can see we have a code which is slightly different compared to the earlier one. What we did here was we kept this composite symbol at the top. In the earlier example, we kept the composite symbol at the bottom. Now, if at all we keep this composite symbol at the middle, that is also possible. Because all these are equal, right? 0 0.15, 0 0.15, 0 0.5, all these are equal. We can keep them anywhere. Only thing is they should be in the decreasing order. They are right now in the decreasing order. So, there is a third code is also possible here. That is, if at all you keep this 0 0.15 in the middle, that is why I told you first one was as low as possible, second one is as high as possible. Now, there can be as middle as possible. That is also possible. That you can work out on your own and you can find out the efficiency. Now, this is the code which we got 0, 100, 101, 110, 111. Now, let us find the efficiency. Here, L is summation of i equals 1 to 5, n i p i. You can see that there are no symbols having 4 digits. All the symbols are having less than 4 digits, but 4 symbols are having 3 digits each. First symbol is having single digit. In the first case, one symbol was having two digits, second symbol was having three digits, last three were having four digits. Let us see which one is more efficient. Here we get L is 1.9 bits per symbol and efficiency is 1.8439 by 1.9 is same value 97.05%. That means both of these codes are equally efficient. Now the variance of the Word lens is calculated as variance of L i is expectation of L i minus L whole square. Please revise your knowledge of statistics. You already studied about what is meant by variance, what is meant by standard deviation, what is meant by expectation in the earlier maths courses. So, variance of L i is expectation of L i minus L whole square. Now, what is expectation? Expectation is nothing but summation of I equals 1 to 5 of Pi into L i minus L whole square. So, in, for the first case, variance of L i, I am computing it here using this particular formula. Pi into L i minus L whole square, the summation I get 1.29. For the second case, it is 0.99. Means, the first case is having larger variance. The second case is having lesser variance, but both are equally efficient. When both are equally efficient, variance wise, which one is better? The second option is having lesser variance and the second code is preferred. Why? What is basically variance? In statistics, you might have seen when we have large number of samples, when the samples are distributed over a range, now we measure the quality of distribution. You might be remembering all types of distributions which you studied. Binomial distribution, Poisson distribution, Bernoulli distribution, all those such types of different distributions are there in statistics. Distribution is nothing but different samples will be obtained are distributed over a period of range. Now, we have to come to a conclusion about how much variant the data is. What do you mean by standard deviation? We set a standard and from the standard, how much is the deviation that we want to measure. You might observe the Gaussian curve where at the top, from the top, we draw a line, vertical line and we make it as sigma, mark it as sigma. Then we write sigma plus 1, sigma minus 1 and that sigma is called as standard deviation. What is sigma square? That is variance. When we find out variance, variance of square root itself is standard deviation, which simply means that from the standard, how much do we deviate in the given distribution? That is going to give us uh, an idea about how much standard our decision is in selecting a particular sample. So, that is how variance is nothing but sigma square. Now, the first one is having larger variance, second having, having smaller variance means in the second case, the samples are not having a larger variance. In the second case, the distribution is better than the first case. 